So hello, and thank you for joining this session of the McGill Executive Institute's Level Up webinar series. My name is Eric Sane. I'm the director of the Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. I see we have people from around Canada and, and literally around the world joining today. So uh, bienvenue. Although you'll be on mute, we want this to be a very interactive session. So by all means, please uh, post your questions, comments, ideas, in the chat button, in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And also for better video viewing, we ask that you keep your video off if possible. Uh, and you can do that by clicking stop video in the lower left corner. The session will last about an hour and include time to answer your questions. It will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. So we're very proud to welcome your webinar leader for today, Elizabeth Mitro. Elizabeth is an advisory board member of the McGill Executive Institute, and she's a specialist in the intersection between belonging, bias, and burnout in the workplace. So again, thank you all for attending. And with that, let's get started. Over to you, Elizabeth. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, that introduction. Um, a little bit more in terms of my background, I come into this work having led communications for the National Institutes of Health, um, their Office of, of Workforce Diversity, which is housed in the director's office. And, and so I, I have a bit of an angle towards uh, healthcare and, and that field, um, but we're going to be talking about, about a whole lot of, of topics that impact um, wellness in the workplace in all kinds of industries. So, um, so to that end, this is, this is an especially apropos topic uh, in the throes of a global pandemic where the workforce is changing and the workplace is, is evolving uh, and we're all kind of feeling it. Uh, so I, I suspect that today as we go through this, this conversation, that there are gonna be a lot of opportunities for you to jump in, ask questions, um, move to a different topic uh, uh, where appropriate to just make sure that this is really, really relevant for you and for your work um, environment. Um, so to that end, we were just chatting before we got on the call that, uh, you know, it's, it's been said that we, we present our agendas boldly and carry them lightly. So um, please, please, please jump in and ask questions and we will make sure that we're um, or really engaged in relevant conversation. So unfortunately, I've been, I'm a recovering burnout researcher. So um, I, I have to start by asking a, a, a question that's gonna at least move us into the conversation around joy and wellness in the workforce. But, but we're gonna start on, on a low, low end. Um, and I want folks to think, and please engage the chat here. Think about your last hard day. What was going on? Is there a word that comes to mind? Work-life balance, stress? Go ahead and, and throw it in the chat. And I know Pamela is doing a fantastic job as a, as a colleague here who, uh, to, <laughs> to kind of name some of these, these themes that come up. Yeah. So. so we're starting to see some answers come in, uh, Elizabeth. Um, we got overwhelmed, exhaustion, killer deadlines exhaustion, out of control, tsunami, I like that one, unmotivated, deadlines, multitasking, but feeling like nothing gets accomplished, despondent, mm -hmm. um, can't get anything done, there's a lot of overwhelm, there's a lot of too many things, a lot of long days, I've got sleep disorder in here, a lack of energy, trying to juggle everything, so this idea wow. of multitasking again, um, see what else drained unable to connect with people that'll be a, a highlight of today's session as well for sure brain fog it is yeah. imposter syndrome you know what's interesting about all of these things and i, I we could interrogate this further and, yes. and <laughs> kind of go into the weeds is if we were to, to, to take a step back and say, well, what are the drivers of that last hard day? Was it um, colleagues, workplace culture, et cetera? Um, we would certainly get yet another, another uh, list of, of some of the, the workplace maladies that so many of you are facing. 
Um, and this is no different than, so when I first started looking into burnout, which was my, my first uh, foray into the space of, of joy, um, I was working at the National Institutes of Health and partnering with the National Academies of Medicine to understand why it was that so many physicians were, in particular, were burning out and people in the healthcare workforce, nurses and so forth. And, and so I went on this national quest uh, to ask that question that I just asked you, tell me about your last hard day. What were the factors that contributed to it? Um, you know, how did it, how did you leave the workplace on those days? And I have to say, while it was interesting, I couldn't do anything with it. And I, I'm sure for many of you who are in leadership, when you get a buffet of maladies, it's really hard to know where to, to, to sort of tackle it. Um, so my, my first, so earlier in my career um, and my, my sort of intellectual focus has always been in rhetoric. So we, how do we talk about these things, right? And, and so because I wasn't finding anything uh, universal or super compelling that we could really tackle from a, a systems change perspective, I started to flip the question. I was also getting burned out on studying burnout, I'll be honest with you. Um, so change the question. And instead of saying, let's talk about your last hard day and what was going on, I started talking about your last best day. Because when we asked the last hard day question, we got this. This is a model um, from, from NAM where we were trying to like parse out all of the different factors that were contributing to, to burnout. And we were getting this very same things that you're, you're responding to here. Um, and again, my lens is, is south of the border. So, um, you know, the high, high rates of burnout, um, overwhelm, not using vacation time and so forth. So we flipped the script. And now I want to I do the same thing with you. So in the chat box, I wish we could share photos, um, but in the chat box, tell, I would love for you to, to, to put a couple words in here about your last great day. Like what was going on? All right, we'll give it a, just a couple of seconds. It would be nice to be able to, Zoom should invent that photo sharing. Yeah. I know, I know. Because <laughs> what's so interesting when I, when you ask, like everyone in the room, show me a picture of, of a moment that you felt a real sense of joy and, and connection. Go for it. Um, yeah, let's see, let's see. So we have energized, fulfilling and rewarding, joy, positive, cheerful, happiness, home run, uh, nature, energizing, family, rejuvenated, lots of biking, finishing mm. renos on my new condo, high energy, motivated and appreciated by my superiors, uh, teamwork and laughter, mm. exercising, accomplished, energizing, <laughs> time to focus. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of family in there. Spent time with my nieces, a long leisure dinner with my dad, um, feeling it's okay to slow down. So completing. So I think there's a, like a lot of completion, a lot of that, you know, sense of accomplishment, and then a lot of family and um, positive interactions, nature, exercising, mm -hmm. travel. <laughs> so, so Tolstoy said, he actually, in, in Anna Karenina, he wrote uh, that all unhappy families are unhappy differently and all happy families are happy in the same way. So when I started to, to go down this path, not asking about your last bad day, but asking about your last great day, what I found was universal consensus. That when people started talking about a great day, they talked about it in, in three buckets. It was about connection. It was connection to their purpose. So they accomplished things. They did something meaningful. Um, connection to each other, to their, their peers and their families. And a sense of, you know, now that I am doing purpose-driven work in the context of connection, I have a sense of hope. Like I, I, I look forward to the future because I look forward to, to continuing to be connected in those spaces. In, in the healthcare environment, I, I often um, sort of bucket these as connection to patients, peers, and purpose. But the same bears out. And actually, um, the AARP uh, here in the, the States did a fabulous study. That, that looked at this very thing. And it was funny, we were doing our research sort of in parallel and finally got together with Dr. Charlotte Ye, who is the head of research for AARP. And, and again and again, all of these different organizations that were looking at 
what drives wellness, we're finding the exact same, the exact same things. Um, before we go on, because I am a, a student of language and I want to just call out my use of lots of different terms, like interchangeably. So I want to just level set here. Um, I want to talk about happiness and how we describe work, you know, wellness, happiness, fulfillment, joy, so forth. So again, putting the onus on y'all to jump into the chat. If let's see, what, what experiment do I want to, do I want to offer now? Use for everyone on the call. If you can jump in the chat and use chocolate and happy in a sentence. And we're going to talk about the language here for just a minute. So we're all on the same page as we go forward. Use chocolate and happiness. <laughs> all right. <laughs> chocolate triggers happiness. Nice. I like that. Chocolate makes me, uh, makes my taste buds happy. Chocolate makes, <gasps> makes me, me smile. happy. Love that one. Yeah. Um, sharing chocolate with my coworkers makes me happy. Well, oh. When I give my kids chocolate, they are happy. <laughs> yes. Whatever it takes. You know, exactly. The kids. Or a lollipop. <laughs> Dark okay. Chocolate okay. So now as y'all are, mm -hmm. so are entering these, now use chocolate and joy in a sentence. <clears throat> Let's see. Boy. We're still on the happiness for now. Giving chocolate makes people happy and joy. Chocolate brings me joy. Uh, the joys yeah. of chocolate. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a lot of chocolate brings me joy. Good Eating chocolate, chocolate yeah. brings me joy. Gives me, brings me, yeah. Yeah, six hours of sleep and uninterrupted. <laughs> That's joyful too, yes. So much bringing of joy. And I am yes. so, so pleased with that. Um, yeah. If only it was that simple, right? Um, hmm. So now last, last question, um, use chocolate and fulfilled in a sentence. We're going to change the syntax a little just by virtue mm. of the word, but chocolate and fulfilled. Let's see. When eating you... chocolate, I feel fulfilled. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, if, if, if chocolate doesn't uh, fulfill you, that's okay. You can use fulfilled in a sentence. In it, in it, that's yeah. okay too. Uh, chocolate fulfills my sweet tooth. Chocolate fulfills my appetite. Chocolate does not fulfill me. Connections do. Chocolate me leaves me unfulfilled. <laughs> uh, when I can avoid chocolate, I feel fulfilled trying to lose weight. <laughs> Love that. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let yeah. me just break down the language here. Cause this is really interesting and, and gets right into how we're going to talk mm -hmm. about uh, the, the work of wellness and fulfillment and all of that. So when I ask someone to talk about happiness, typically their response is X makes me happy, right? If you were to ask a kiddo, they, they, it's, it's X makes me happy. So some transient thing, some external force comes in and it makes me happy. The, of course, when it's no longer there, we're no longer happy. When we talk about joy, we tend to use the language of X brings me joy. My children bring me joy. So you're getting a little bit more relational. You have to accept it, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a relationship. When we start to talk about fulfillment, we typically speak in I. I am fulfilled when. So when we are thinking about how we create a workforce where you're not just like throwing candy bars, at your, to, for, for a momentary bit of happiness, but we really want to create fulfilled workforces. We need to start thinking about where, not so much about the happiness, but about fulfillment and what drives fulfillment. And that gets right back into what we were talking about earlier with connection. When I, I when I, you know, asked that question about your last great day. Um, so we're going to be using a little bit of language interchangeably, but be mindful of this because it's really important um, as we, as we move forward. Okay, so in the context of COVID, even before COVID, um, one of what we were seeing is all of the, when we look at the levels of burnout and dissatisfaction and, and sadness and loneliness and all of it, we were seeing this rise in, in profound sense of disconnection 
right? So if we just proved that that connection was a key driver for a sense of wellness and fulfillment, what's happening outside the walls of the workforce that certainly influence what's going on inside the walls of the workforce is a rise in profound, profound loneliness among all of us, not just employees, right? Um, in the last few years, uh, we've seen the UK develop an office, a ministry of loneliness. Um, I was just, I had the great good fortune of flying for the first time in a couple of years recently. And I was at a bookstore in an airport and all the titles were, you know, by Vivek Murphy, loneliness and together and, and you know, talking all about this, this um, increasing disconnection um, for, for all of us. And we know when we look at the data that that this sense of loneliness and disconnection is is so profound it's actually uh riskier loneliness is riskier to your health and more more troublesome to your health than diabetes and smoking 15 cigarettes a day um so so it has real consequences and those real consequences of disconnection and loneliness are, are in, get imbued into the workforce um, there's a really great study uh, that that kind of proves the opposite um, called the Rosetto effect um, was it was a study that was uh, conducted in, in the 1950s in Pennsylvania and of this very high risk group of Italian Americans who and I quote drank with wild abandon and smoked stogie uh, cigars every day um, and they were minors. Um, there were, was no, there were no cases of heart disease or, um, uh, so myocardial in, infarction, heart disease, stroke among this very high risk group. And when they started to study, peel that onion and, and start to study what, what was going on and compare it to other similar groups, they found that the, the leading cause for that sense of, of joy and connection and the, the reduction in, in sadness, loneliness, and, and physical response to those things um, was social connection. People regularly had dinners with each other. The workplace was a space where you you connected, you met your spouse, you, you know, all of those things. So, so there's this body of research that's emerging um, in the last several years around the, the profound, powerful impact of creating spaces that don't just mitigate burnout, right? Don't just address your workload, but actually cultivate a sense of connection that is good for your health and for your work product, both inside the workplace and in your communities. There's a, and I always show this slide um, because I think it's just awesome. The, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs has, has typically been, um, been framed in a way that these site our psychological needs like air water food all those things um are most basic and then from there we move up the ladder so then we have connection then we have community then we have love and belonging the debate that's happening in in my world of of joy and love is that we're actually starting to see that that in fact love and belonging are even more fundamental than psychological needs um, because, it, and there's a wonderful book by Matthew Lieberman, uh, Social, where he argues this point that, you know, we, we spend so much time focusing on like, what's the bare minimum we need to give people, like our employees, our colleagues, our, you know, uh, those around us to ensure a level of wellness. Um, but, and so we tend to, to focus on, on just very basic needs. Um, but evolutionarily, like biologically, when we are born, we can't access phys physiological needs. We can't access food on our own or shelter on our own, any of those elements. So we actually have to be in relationship first. So that's our primary need is to first be in relationship in order to access the things that keep us alive, right? Baby doesn't just feed on its own. So we have to be in, in relationships. So there's this wonderful, I, I just love this slide because it's, it's provocative enough and, and it starts to, to get us thinking that, uh, about you know, what, what, are, what is the most important thing that we do um, for our wellness. Uh, and, and the argument, there's a strong argument to be made that it's, it's about connection and love and belonging. 
but there's some other benefits to community as well. Um, and I certainly spoke to that with the Rosetto effect, but from a workplace perspective, uh, in, in your own rounds of influence, there are four really, really powerful ways that you can leverage connection, uh, certainly to, to buoy uh, the, the general wellness of your workforce, but also to get stuff done, right? So the, the, the four that I, I have identified in my own work is that when we are deeply connected to each other and to our purpose and at living this purpose-driven life in the context of a community, we buoy fulfillment, we, we simply feel better. And there is a, a, a massive body of, of research uh, around how those, those social ties uh, really reinforce our sense of place in the universe. But what's interesting in the fulfillment space and something I would challenge any, uh, you know, leaders, supervisors, workplace managers to, to think about is that it doesn't just need to be your, your big relationships that buoy fulfillment. We're seeing increasing uh, research being done around what I like to call ambient relationships. So the person, like the barista at your favorite coffee shop and the person that goes on the train with you at the 810 every morning to get to work. All of those landscape people, and when I say landscape, it's like all of people that just sort of make up your universe um, and add color and flavor and all of those things actually provide us with a sense of, of place and meaning and connection uh, that we would miss if, we, if they weren't there. Um, there's a wonderful book by Eric Klinenberg on the Chicago heat wave, which was the largest uh, public health um, event in the United States in recent years. So it was in, in late 1990s, um, Chicago just got like hit with a heat wave. But what was really fascinating was that the deaths were not from heat exhaustion per se. It wasn't people going into the ER or the ED and, and getting admitted because they were, they were uh, in, in a state of trauma. It was actually all of the deaths after the heat wave, when people's bodies were found in their apartments to the tune of hundreds of people who didn't have people checking in on them, they were lonely. Um, actually in, in the UK, you know, you see all these stats around because they're, they're doing so much work around this that, you know, 25% of the population considers TV their closest confidant. Um, so this sense of connection as a means to fulfillment, to check in on each other, to, to, um, you know, support wellness and placemaking becomes really, really important. Um, community and connection in your workforce can also do, do dividends on uh, communication. So when we see people and connect deeply with people and, and cultivate that sense of empathy, um, because they're no longer just colleagues, they're, they're, confidants and their, their uh, you know, peers and close friends, we quiet our reptilian brain. We are slower to respond or to react because we're listening. We listen to actually listen as opposed to listening to respond, uh, which is typically how we, we engage um, in, in dialogue. So when you have two individuals, there was a fabulous study done a few years ago. When you have two individuals who know each other, um, or have a sense of connection to one another, uh, engaged in conflict, they'll, they'll reduce, so typically five seconds into a, a, that pause, everybody knows the awkward pause, but five seconds into the awkward pause, people interrupt people. That's, that's just sort of how we do it because we're very uncomfortable with silence. In, in relation dyads where people know each other and they have a sense of empathy and connection, that doubles, that space of silence doubles to actually like create space to co-create solutions, to listen more deeply. So we listen with an ear to really understand, not to just respond. And the two other areas that are, are, are so critical, um, you know, we think about building cultures of connection in our workplace to reduce uh, burnout. 
it's a great avenue for workplaces to also then strengthen culture, to imbue spaces with cultures of belonging, to say, you know, I don't know what your lived experience is as a woman or as a person of color or so forth. So we're creating these like environments where we can actually think about culture differently and, and co-create cultures with our workforce rather than it simply being a top-down mandate, it becomes this collective space where we can really engage. Um, last, last point, and then I actually wanna address a, a comment that was made in the chat um, a, around moral injury. So I've, I've often been shunned for studying, quote, the soft stuff, that community building is soft stuff. And um, what I would say is that if you're thinking about ways to address um, burnout in your workforce and you wanna tackle that, I have the slide analog style, if you wanna tackle all of those things that um, came up in, when you ask about burnout, you know, workplace compression and, and stress and all of those things, you have to do it in a tribe change doesn't happen with one person. I mean, there, there, there are those instances where it does, but building community in your institution is a political act. It is a means to organize and understand from a broad swath of identities to actually implement meaningful change. So it's not the soft stuff. It's actually very, very hard and done well, you know, creating spaces of where there's real psychological safety it is an opportunity to, to move into um, to, to systems change. I wanna, um, I'm gonna pause for a second because I saw a comment about moral injury and I'm gonna assume probably falsely that the individual who, who uh, noted it might be in healthcare because moral injury is a pretty common expression that we hear in, in healthcare. So a bit of a sidebar before we get into some practical steps to actually do community in your, in your space. The question was, what do you think of the idea that we should substitute moral injury for burnout? So moral injury was a term coined um, by, by a, uh, an anthropologist and a psychologist during Vietnam. And the, uh, Dr. Jonathan Shea, and he wrote uh, about um, a, a book called Achilles in Vietnam about how what we call burnout um, and that overwhelm and frustration is actually us practicing our, our practicing medicine engaged in our careers in a manner that is inconsistent with our values. So that's to sort of net it out. Like how do we... Uh, and we're going to actually get into some of this language stuff here momentarily, but um, are we working in ways that are inconsistent with our values? So we see, so where do we see high levels of burnout slash moral injury? We see it in healthcare where individuals are asked to, to cut corners because someone's insurance doesn't quite apply or they can't afford things. So a clinician who really wants to treat someone's diabetes, for example, um, but that individual doesn't have a refrigerator to put insulin in, like they're in a situation that their hands are tied, right? So they can't do it all. We see high rates of moral injury in the legal field where you wanna do well by your clients, but the circumstances are, are such that your hands are tied. Um, so in a lot of areas that where people are working for bigger institutions where they don't set the rules um, and they're confronted with barriers on a regular basis, we see high, high levels of moral injury. Um, and, and that's been the, the term that's kind of been thrown around. Um, I think it's, I think it's an interesting conversation. So to, to the individual that, that wrote that, um, I'd love to offline because there's a lot there. Um, but, but just something to be, to be mindful of in terms of language. And again, a place where an institution has a lot of leverage um, 
to, to ensure that, that, you know, folks are practicing their, their position, their work, doing their work in a way that is consistent with their values. All right. So a couple of just very practical things. So I, I, I trust I've made the case that um, we should probably start getting a little friendlier with our colleagues and developing a culture of belonging and just like connecting um, in, in a really meaningful way with those around us for agency, for, um, for wellness and so forth. I wanna talk about some elephants and scapegoats, but I'm gonna start with our story. So, one of the, the biggest things that I've seen, um, and when I started doing research in this space, I, I must have interviewed 2,000, 3,000 people. I mean, it was, it was significant, my team uh, writ large. And so it wasn't just in the US, it was all over, all over the, the world. And one of the biggest barriers to even opening the dialogue was people actually disclosing that they felt a sense of burnout, that they were overwhelmed. In, in the workplace. And so as a, an initial step, one of the things I would, I would encourage leaders and, and individuals across um, industry to start thinking about is how you tell your story. Um, you know, storytelling and, and sort of self-disclosure is critical to wellness and it opens the door to connection. And here's how it does it. And I, I just, I love this so much. Um, and it's one of those things you have to, to kind of do to get. But as we start to tell our stories um, to deeply connect with our colleagues, to start to, to imbue our, our cultures with, with a sense of belonging, four big things happen. First, we go from victim to protagonist. Like we are in control. And the cool thing about being in control of your narrative is that you get to write the ending. So you do the meaning making, you, you start to say, you know, yes, this was really, really difficult. And that messy part when it got really, really difficult is actually the best part. That's when people start really engaging with, with your story, with you is where you have that level of vulnerability to, to really step into your power, um, to write the ending and, you know, and to make the meaning in that process. So if you're thinking about ways to uh, rethink burnout, um, one great starting point is to convene your teams to in spaces where they get to talk about their stories and and share really deeply what's what's kind of going on in their in their world. More scapegoats and elephants. We're going there. <laughs> um. So, you know, when I do presentations or I go into to, uh, systems and, and start to, to work on um, issues of burnout, I always get like three big pushbacks. First one is work-life balance. We hear this, see this all the time, you know, that, that and then we're instructed to like find out, you know, find that perfect balance. To do work life integration, that trending, um, to have it all. And so, one of the biggest scapegoats I find is that people say, well, it's not really burnout. I'm burned out because I don't have work life balance. Um, there was a wonderful book by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. It, it's a bit of a tome, so settle in if you're, if you're going to tackle this one. But um, we often do a very poor job. Um, talking about our feelings, right? So, and why this is germane to the work-life balance conversation is that when you, just like when we started this conversation off and I said, um, you know, tell me about your last rough day, you could have said you were burned out. Um, you could have said you were anxious and we certainly got a lot of that anxious, stressed, all of those sorts of things. Um, for most people, and the data certainly backs this up, and you can see it on the, the slide, for most people, we do a pretty lousy job articulating what it is, like, what's the word for this thing I'm feeling? Like, is it stress? Or is it, um, 
uh, is it overwhelmed? Do I feel disrespected by my colleagues? And so the, the result of that, of not being able to specifically identify how we feel and instead just kind of throw everything at it, is that we not only misdiagnose, but then our intervention is, is off, right? So if I were to, to, to go back to the original list and, and look at all of the, the, the factors that were driving burnout for, for so many of you, um, we would see a lot of words used interchangeably and, and the same intervention wouldn't work for one group as it does for another, right? So you may be better served working your tail off some weekends uh, and getting a lot of stuff done. And that would be the right intervention for, for a sense of, you know, dissatisfaction or a vacation would work. It, but when we don't properly identify like what the it is, we wind up um, putting everything into these buckets of burnout and work-life balance challenges. And, and then just hope that a yoga mat I love yoga, that, that a yoga mat will solve that. And, and we know that it, it doesn't, right? So be very careful of language. One of the fun, um, well, fun, not so fun challenges that I, I have uh, presented to healthcare professionals uh, in the last year is when they are um, engaged with their colleagues and their, their staff to encourage them not to use the word burnout. So, and when we do that, it's very, very interesting. I was, I was just on a call yesterday and um, people were like, oh, I'm so burned out, it's like I'm overwhelmed. And I said, all right, well, let's set aside that language because there's no universal definition um, for it. And we all interpret it the way we do, uh, which can be very, very, you know, individualistic. Um, what are you actually feeling? Are you tired? Are you, do you need vacation? Like what's going on? Um, and that could be really powerful to, to put people in the driver's seat of articulating those, uh, those feelings. Okay. This is, this is why I leave this slide for the end because it's sort of the bomb to drop. Um, when we talk about scapegoats and elephants for why we are not um, succeeding in creating connected environments where people really feel heard and seen is that it is really hard to make friends as adults. Um, really, really hard. I alluded to some of these statistics earlier around loneliness. Um, we struggle. And, we, you know, in a time of physical distancing, we struggle even more. Um, so, you know, the, our number of friends typically peaks in our 20s and, and then it steadily, precipitously declines. And it becomes very challenging to, to go to people and say, hey, I'd actually, I'd actually really love to be friends. You want to go out for, for a drink? Um, and in fact... Uh, I was, I'm often accused in my, in my world of being, um, it, I was called Anthony Bourdaining healthcare when I first got started in, in addressing issues of burnout and kind of bringing people together because I always brought them together over food. And so we would have these like wonderful convenings and hundreds of them across the country, you know, every year uh, to bring people together to just, to just chat. And my one instruction to whomever was inviting me to come and do these dinners was that they had to send the invitation. And that act of sending an invitation of asking someone out was like, it threw people back to middle school and like a dance, you know, and, and the sense of the fear of rejection um, by, by asking someone to spend, have lunch with you to do those, those sorts of things. And so or the flip side, everyone just fakes it over <laughs> for dinner and they, they just kind of play a role and, and answer. We don't bring our full story into the space. We don't um, really fully engage in, in ways that, we, that would be um, uh, antidotes to some of the burnout and overwhelm that we're, we're seeing in the space. I'm sure that if 
we had the opportunity to do breakouts and, and tackle this topic, it would be uh, especially interesting for, for folks. So the last thing I want to touch on, because uh, I want to give plenty of time for us to, to chat, is, is just supporting the sense of reframing. Um, so typically, when we talk about burnout and work-life balance and all of these things, the thing that, that consistently comes up is, how do I better manage my time? Right? So it becomes a time management issue. Uh, and, and sort of, you know, the onus becomes on us as individuals to, to do time management. Uh, and I will say very, very bluntly here that we don't do time management. That does not exist. That's not a thing. We do task management, but none of us, I, I think, on the call um, manages time. That's a, that's a little bit more ephemeral and, uh, and supernatural. So our job is to do task management. So when we reframe that in, from not just how do I better manage my time so I can just shove more things in. Instead, how do we integrate the most important aspects of ourselves in, to create lives of meaning and purpose? So if we know, um, if we know that, that leading a purpose-driven life in the context of community is, is sort of the, the silver bullet it's the it's the thing right that um that we're striving for then we're asking the wrong question when we start to to delve into just time management instead well, the question that we need to be asking is is again what's most important to you and how are you making sure that that those things that are most important to you are at the top of your to-do list and not the stuff that you hope you get to at the end of the day. And that's a very, very hard conversation to have with yourself. Um, and because it also challenges us to, to think about how we prioritize or delegate. Um, and that can be incredibly, incredibly overwhelming. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's very helpful as, as you're polling your teams and, and doing that re-entry that all of us will soon be doing to bring our team members back together in some capacity or, you know, and, and do a bit of a, of a retrospection of the last year and a half is, is to think about how we ask the questions to ensure that people are fully showing up and doing the work that is most valuable to us as an organization and most meaningful to individuals, um, in their own, in their own realms. Um, just, just to kind of tie up and if I can leave with two, two big takeaways, um, find your people, find your purpose. So when, when we think about burnout and, and the, the, um, framework has always been like, just get more done or balance better. My challenge to us is to actually think about who's in our realm of influence that matters, that we can go to, that we can build community and, and develop agency with, and why. why. Why are we doing the work that we do? How do we define um, our purpose and our meaning? And how do we set intentions then around that? So that we're not waking up every day with 50 things on our to-do list, but we're saying, okay, what are the three things that I'm going to do that matter and who in my universe can support that with me and, and really develop that purpose-driven life. I think I, I'm just glancing at the chat because um, we're going to go into... <laughs> This is just a fun slide to, to bring us all out of this conversation in a way that's supportive. But, I, but before I get to it, I just want to uh, note a couple of things that have, have come up on the chat. Um, there's and, that, yeah, there's been a couple of questions Elizabeth threw out. Yeah, do you want to go ahead and jump into that and then I'll, I'll kind of move forward? Uh, sure, there was, well, one, just to note, uh, there's uh, uh, like, um, 
would like some further explanation on uh, the statement. A 2014 study found that more weak ties a person has, the happier, happier yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just that's, a little elaboration on that. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. I call them ambient relationships. Um, so just that that sort of noise around us, all the people that we okay. recognize on the street. So that's that's really about the weak social ties um, because they're so place making and place affirming um, for for all of us. And I think we can all come up with ten people on our list that we see every day, and we probably don't know their names, and that's okay. Um, but they're just part of our our universe. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And actually Heather and Julia were commenting that, you know, even those little relationships, they didn't realize meant anything to them until they were taken away due to COVID. Right. So Um, here we're still kind of on lockdown. So, you know, many of us are still working from home and haven't resumed those regular schedules yet. Um, There was a conver, there was a question about the conversations these types of have a conversations with your team, bringing them up, are they conversations that are better to have one-on-one or as a team in general, how would you suggest approaching this type of? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So most of my research is funded by United Health Group. Um, and, and so we're studying that very, that very question. What's the best format and cadence to engage with, with, colleagues and sort of start talking about the elephants in the room. Um, My recommendation and our early results from our study is that the best case scenario is to bring everyone together, um, whatever that looks like for your team. And in some of the teams that I work with, it's 2000 people, but bring everybody together virtually um, and do a session on the power of community and, and talk about use the L word, which nobody wants to use lonely, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and community and burnout and start like giving voice to those things, but do like a one hour learning session or a didactic session. And then from there, encourage your, whether they're departments or units or, um, affinity groups, like all women, all early careerists, people of color, whatever that, that then that's, you know, space looks like, but then have them do reflection about a week later, let them sit on it, you know, get the, get the, give them the data and, and sort of the the case, and then let them explore how they want to operationalize that information and, Mm -hmm. and, and sort of, you know, develop that psychological safety to say like, actually, I'm really lonely at work. Um, or I'm struggling at home. And so I'm sorry, I bring it out at work. Um, so to really begin the, those dialogues, but yeah, absolutely. If you want to do, I do a 60 minute didactic and then a follow-up reflection session. Right. So that follow-up is really what. Is, That's where the magic happens. Exactly. You can't just, you know, give people the information and then not. Makes sense. Um, and maybe we'll do one more just before we finish up the slides and then, sure. uh, and then we can, uh, have, we'll have time again, I think, for, for more questions. Um, do you think the Pomodoro technique really works? And I'm not really too sure what that means. So I'm, I'm not curious. I'm familiar with that. Me neither. So, Greta, would you like to, um, maybe we can move on and um, I'll wait for Greta to, to uh, elaborate yeah. in the chat and then she can. Uh, it's yeah. funny. A lot of these, these um, there's. Oh, setting a timer. Maybe that's it. Anyway, <laughs> you know, it's funny that there's like so many, as, as we, um, you get in the space of relationship building and community building and mitigating burnout and all of that, there's so many different techniques and models that are out there, um, mm-hmm. for, uh, communication that some that, you know, it's, it can be hard to, to keep up. For oh. sure. It's well, a- <laughs> I'm going to have to look, look that up. Um, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. I'll let you finish up the slides and then we'll have more time for questions. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to throw in a silly slide. Cause you know, it's so funny to me, we get so heavy in the space of joy and fulfillment and, and burnout and all the stuff that's going on. And so I always just like to throw everybody for a loop and do something, something a little unconventional. So, you know, 
again, I, I'm in the healthcare workforce. And so I often hear about just high levels of dissatisfaction in that, in that space. Um, but I stumbled across a body of research recently that, um, that Nobel prize winners were three times as likely to have a hobby than the rest of us. Um, and you can see some of the other the other stats here. And so when when I've chatted with folks who are sort of at the at their wits end, and they're just they can't they're not connecting at work. There's this this profound sense of of you know burnout or to the point of moral injury, betrayal, and overwhelm. My and and we just can't seem to get past it. My advice is get a hobby. And in fact, in the, in the book that I, I referenced on the previous slide, 10% Happier, there's a fabulous story about this guy who was just so sad. He just was having a lot of feels. And so he checked out of life, went and got a yurt in Nepal and just, just like he was going to go find himself. And years passed by, he has this opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama, and he goes to the Dalai Lama and he says, you know, I, I'm just so sad. Like I can't get over it. And, and it, my nothingness seems to be fulfilling, whatever. And um, the Dalai Lama's response, I'd love to have been a fly on that wall, was get a life. Get a life. And, and what he meant, and so he starts to unpack it and he unpacks it in the book. And it's, it's such a, it's a great story um, that, that I less eloquent in telling, but what he was saying was, you know, we, like get some hobby, like if, if there's a way that, that, you know, once a week or once a month, you can take a woodworking class. You see on this 7.5 times more likely for Nobel prize winners to have woodworking in their, their, um, among their other specialties. So, but just being able to get connected in that way, community service, um, hobbies, all of that. Uh, once we start to get out of ourselves, um, and I'm just gonna throw that on for the purpose of the chat, but once we start to get out of ourselves a little bit and, and really begin to connect with others, connect to a sense of purpose, um, get a hobby, we, we find that we, we're able to be in environments with other people that have shared, um, shared loves and passions and, and a desire to do more or just get out of your brain, which can be really, really helpful too. Um, there's a really great question on the chat and um, I know we are coming to time. So I'll, I will briefly answer that, but there was a, a comment about how online community can but does it, does it have the same benefits as, as in person? Um, and yes, um, to a degree, there are great strategies to do online community really well. So like in my case, when I'm facilitating groups all across the country for, for United, I will send like a deck of cards in the mail. We've got these great question cards that we use. So, or, you know, give people a Grubhub or, or, you know, delivery coupon and, and uh, our gift, you know, voucher so that we can still have a kind of shared experience or, or share a recipe that everybody's going to have together. Um, there are ways that you can do that really effectively. It's never going to be the same as being in person. Um, but it, it is, there's still some really powerful tools that you can use to create intimacy um, as you develop online communities. I know it's not easy for sure. There, I mean, while we're on the, the, the subject of online, uh, there was a question earlier uh, about social media and whether it helps to fill the loss uh, of the of landscape uh, yeah. relationships during COVID. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's, there's, unfortunately, intuitively, I would say yes. But um, I am a scientist, and so the science does not uh, back that up. So the science would suggest that um, the more engaged, particularly at certain age brackets that we are in social media, the uh, less happy we are, um, and the greater the social disconnection. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm of two minds. 
Mm-hmm. Again, I think if it's intentional and it's a means to engage offline, so it's a way to kind of maintain relationship um, so that when you do engage offline, that, that you've got some, some basis to a foundation to connect, that's great. Um, but again, you know, it's always, I, I'm a fact, fact lady and mm-hmm. uh, facts don't bear it out writ large among larger data sets, okay. um, that those are, that social media is a, um, acceptable, um, uh, you know, opportunity. So. Right. It's also, um, you're painting, you're, you're creating that story of your life on, on social media, right? Only the parts of yourself you want people to it's see. Curious. So it's not a natural yeah. relationship. It's very, oh, I love that. I, uh, so uh tomorrow and I are are clearly on the same way. <laughs> yeah curated. It's, it's, it's a curated version yeah. of ourselves and so the challenge is how do you create authentic versions of yourself in a digital space and that's where actually telling your story for folks on the call um who were say interested in like writing your story and and publishing that that's a really nice space to be in because mm-hmm. it's it's super vulnerable and very hard, but it also gives you that, that like opportunity, that segue into a broader community where you're able to be really vulnerable. Um, I love that. Yeah. We got to change it, right? We have to change the way it's the curated uh, content. Um, Okay. I know we're coming to time and there's been some questions previously. So I I really want to get to those. Um, If we know that community is so important, how can we how can people consciously give it the right place in their lives? If they are so into their own problems, you know, work, family issues in their own world, like at the end of the day, how it gets really tiring. How can you, you know, kind of bring people out of the, the issues they're having within your context, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the biggest, uh, bits of feedback that I get, uh, from, from people in the workplace. They're like, it's just one more thing I got to do. Like one more thing I'm going to fail at. So where I would encourage people to, to start would be meals. Um, so if you want to just do one thing a month, like just one, like we're going to keep the bar real low, um, would be, you know, like, so in my, in my case, every, on Sundays, I make homemade pasta and I've gotten the habit of inviting people over for that. So just one small thing that, that we're, that we're already doing that we can begin integrating. Um, if you've got regular staff meetings, uh, on a weekly basis, then be really intentional about taking the first five minutes, uh, or 10 minutes, uh, Vivek Murthy, who wrote together, he's a surgeon general here in the, the States. Um, every single staff meeting that he has the first five minutes, one person gets to talk about their life gets to show a picture gets to whatever that looks like and they they get one slide in the deck for the 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 team meeting and they just like gab and it's great it's a it's so easy so where can we integrate connection into our pre-existing like stuff um so we all eat dinner i assume um every night so is there a person that can you set an extra plate uh, or can you rather than again, for, for those of you in the workplace, um, rather than ordering lunch in and having it as bagged lunch on the, a table against a wall, go family style, have everybody sit at the table and go family style. And instead of people serving themselves, your challenge could be everyone has to serve somebody else. And that becomes so much fun and it Mm. becomes a space to just like connect and share and, and, and be part of each other's orbit, as opposed to everyone grabbing the bag lunch at the, at the, you know, in the conference room and then going in their little bubble to watch the the presentation. So there's a lot of tips and tricks. I wrote a, um, uh, an extensive toolkit for United health group that I'm happy to share uh, with anyone. So it's a PDF uh, that kind of gets into some of those really easy, low lift, uh, interventions that you can do to just start that dialogue. Um, how do we, you know, bring people into, to the space? So I love that. Yeah. So I, 
I know there's like a lot of other questions um, and we're happy to, you know, take them offline. If you send, send me an email, we can definitely um, elaborate on some of them. But I know that Elizabeth really wants to share this closing challenge and I think it's really important. Uh, we want to share it'll be it too. really fast. It's, no, be and it's amazing. So I think it's really important. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap up with this slide. Um, I am very easy to get in touch with. And so if folks are, are interested, I know you can reach out to Pamela. Um, and, and so you can certainly reach out to me at women writers in medicine. Um, so a couple things to just get the ball rolling. If you left this talk inspired to do something, um, First, and most importantly, for one month, grab a stack of post-it notes or a folder or whatever, you know, journal. And at the end of every day, jot down one thing that went well and one thing uh, personally, uh, and then one thing professionally that worked well. And you can define that any way you want to. Like what, what like brought me joy? What was, what was really effective that I was like, check. Don't look at it for a month. So you can just jot it down, stick it in a drawer. And then at the end of the month, uh, and it's especially great if you use post-it notes, you'll start to cluster themes of like this consistently made, like brought me a sense of accomplishment or it, it lightened my load. So when you start to cluster by theme, you, you get a sense of where, where might be a place like in these other bullet points that I share where you really thrive and, and things that are, are barriers to that. And then you can have an honest conversation with yourself and with your partner to say, I did this for 30 days. I know that these things are really going well. So how can I do more of that? And these things just didn't work for me. Like I, I like, these are the barriers. How can we do less of that or delegate? You might find there's more resources to do that as well. So just, just kind of food for thought, but the 30 day challenge, um, which is so easy to do. It is a post-it note, um, not a journal entry. It's a great way to just get started on thinking about how you create and work environments that, that are, um, that bring out everybody's best and bring everyone fully in to those spaces. Oh, I love that. I'm definitely going to do this challenge. So I hope that everybody on this call and everyone who listens to the recording will do it as well. <laughs> um, okay. That's all the time we have for today. I know we went a little bit over, but um, thank you everyone for joining this level up series. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this extremely timely and very important discussion. I think uh, everyone has benefited so much from this. I certainly have. And um Thank you everyone who joined to make this a possibility. We'll be back next week with a very different topic, which is entrepreneurship, uh, excuse me, AI and entre entrepreneurship. So using analytics, uh, so totally different uh, track there, but uh, we hope to see you join us then. Uh, have a great day, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Bye.